Good afternoon, and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientist monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Eric Nessler will present The Biology of Addiction. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation funds the most innovative ideas in neuroscience and psychiatry to better understand the causes and develop new ways to treat brain and behavior disorders. These disorders include addiction, ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, eating disorders, OCD, post-traumatic stress, and schizophrenia. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $394 million to fund more than 5,700 grants to more than 4,700 scientists around the world. 100% of all donor contributions for research are invested in our grants to scientists. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Eric Nessler. Dr. Nessler is Dean for Academic and Scientific Affairs, Director of the Friedman Brain Institute, and Professor of Neuroscience, Pharmacological Sciences, and Psychiatry at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He is a member of our Scientific Council, received the 2009 Falcone Prize for Outstanding Achievement in Effective Disorders Research, the 2008 Goldman Rakik Prize for Outstanding Achievement in Cognitive Neuroscience Research, and was a Foundation Distinguished Investigator Grantee in 1996. Today's webinar will begin with Dr. Nestler's presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel on your screen. Feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation. Following the presentation, I will ask your questions to Dr. Nestler and will address as many as possible in the time allotted. And now, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Nestler. Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jeff. It really is a pleasure to be here today. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, today, I gather that there is a, a wide spectrum of experience uh, among our listeners today. So I wanted to um, start out with a very basic view, uh, illustration of how we view the addiction process. And then as I get through the lecture, I'll get increasingly more sophisticated and talk about some of our recent research into the biology of addiction. Uh, but let me just uh, begin by making the case that despite the fact that addiction is obviously involving many important psychological and social factors, that at its core, it's a biological process. It, it involves the ability of certain chemical substances, which we call drugs of abuse, to act on a vulnerable brain to create a change in behavior that we describe as an addiction syndrome. And I'll be defining some of those terms as we go on. That medical model view of addiction has two main components as described in this first slide. First is the pathophysiology of addiction, understanding how drugs of abuse change the brain to cause that syndrome. And secondly, a matter of individual risk, what it is that makes certain individuals more vulnerable to addiction than others. We know that addiction is about 50% heritable. That's a big number that makes addiction more heritable than high blood pressure, for example. But the heritability is extremely complicated with many hundreds of genes involved, each gene contributing only a minute fraction. The remaining 50% of the risk is presumably mediated by life experiences, a range of environmental exposures like early life adversity, peer pressure, and so on. So we believe that th it is only through an improved understanding of the biology of addiction that it will be possible to develop better treatments and eventually cures and preventive measures. The goal of the work is not to produce some magic pill that will cure addiction, that that won't be possible, but we feel that medical treatments for addiction will be necessary to augment and make behavioral therapies and rehabilitation more effective. So let's start by some of these um, uh, 
definitions. How do we define addiction? It is sobering that here we are in 2019 and we still lack objective diagnostic measures to uh, tell whether a person is addicted or track his or her progress during treatment. There's no brain scan, blood test, or genetic test that is helpful. So addiction is defined like all psychiatric syndromes solely on the basis of behavioral abnormalities. And my uh, view of that is to describe a loss of control over drug use. Some people refer to this as a compulsive seeking and taking of drug despite horrendous adverse consequences. Really in the extreme, a drug takes over a person's life. And one of the cardinal features of addiction clinically is that individuals can remain at increased risk for relapse despite many years of abstinence. So whatever drugs are doing to the brain, they produce very stable, long-lasting changes. The term drug abuse is another term that's been used, and it's less clearly defined and is usually used to describe patterns of drug use that are similar but are less severe than for addiction. It's impossible to overstate the impact that addiction has on humanity. I've listed on this slide just a few of the statistics. I'm not going to go over them in detail. I'll just offer two more. We know that drug addiction is one of the top 10 causes of disability worldwide. When we look at recent data, which suggest that over 70,000 Americans die of drug overdoses each year, that is a staggering number for me. I grew up in the 1970s during the Vietnam War. That means that we lose more Americans to drug abuse every year than we lost in the entire span of the Vietnam War over 15 years. So something has to be done about this epidemic. At the bottom of the slide, I uh, make the point that although today we are, major, we are primarily facing an opioid epidemic, what we've seen in the United States over the past century are waves of use of different drugs of abuse. And one of the mistakes we've made, in my view, is that we've used what I would call a whack-a-mole approach. When there's an opioid epidemic, we focus on opioids. When there's a cocaine or methamphetamine epidemic, we focus on those drugs only for other addictions to pop up. What we need is a more concerted global effort attacking the entire addiction syndrome. So one of the major questions that I'd like to address today is that what is it about a very small number of the billions of chemicals that are known in real or virtual space. What is it about these few particular substances that imbue them with the ability to produce a behavioral syndrome which we describe as addiction? This slide lists the major classes of drugs of abuse. I'm not gonna go over that in any detail, but the first point that we can make right away is that the cardinal feature of these drugs that make them addicting has nothing to do with their chemical structures per se. So this slide illustrates that every class of drug of abuse has a very different chemical structure. So it's something outside the chemical structure that uh, represents the core ingredient of addictiveness. And so the question is, what is that feature? In order to make advances in understanding that question, we need to use animal models, which are absolutely essential in order for us to obtain mechanistic information. And I would make the argument that our animal models for drug addiction are better than those for any other psychiatric syndromes. And that's highlighted by this first model, which is called drug self-administration. If we take a mouse, a rat, or a monkey, and we give them the opportunity to press a lever or do something else, they will self-administer and addict themselves to the same range of drugs that humans will self-administer and addict themselves to. And a certain subset of the animals will lose control over that drug intake. And in fact, if given unlimited access to drugs, a portion of the animals will even overdose. That's a pretty good animal model of what we see in uh, humans with addiction. Moreover, after learning self-administration and addicting themselves, Animals will remain at increased risk for relapse, just as we see in people, for many, many months. And that relapse can be triggered by the drug itself or by drug-associated cues, that means drug-associated memories, or by stress, the same triggers that occur in humans. Two other animal models that have been very useful, one is condition place preference, where an animal learns to prefer an environment paired with drug exposure that is thought to model 
some of these Q associated learning events that occurs in human addicts as well, and a method called intracranial self-stimulation where a drug of abuse will promote an animal's choice to electrically stimulate a certain brain region. And the use of these animal models, the availability of these very good animal models has made it possible for us to learn an enormous amount about the actions of drugs of abuse on the brain. What I'm showing in this cartoon is a synapse. A synapse is where two nerve cells come together, the end of one nerve cell and the beginning of another nerve cell. And they communicate by the release of a chemical substance called a neurotransmitter. Dopamine would be an example of a neurotransmitter released by some nerve cells into the synapse, which act on receptor proteins on the second nerve cell. And we've learned over the last two decades the initial mechanism by which, which all drugs of abuse, despite their very different chemical structures, act on the synapse in the brain. Many drugs of abuse listed here mimic the body's own endogenous neurotransmitter substances. Other drugs of abuse called stimulants, like cocaine and amphetamine, act through the dopamine pump, which takes dopamine in the synapse and brings it back into the nerve terminal, turning that dopamine signal off. And still other drugs of abuse act on a range of ion channels in the brain, proteins that control the electrical activity of nerve cells. And based on this information, it has been possible to identify where in the brain drugs of abuse produce these actions at the synapse. And this has uh, defined for us a series of brain regions which we call brain re reward regions. These are areas of the brain that evolved a long time ago, over a billion years ago in evolution, and evolved to mediate our responses to natural rewards like food, sex, and social interactions. These brain areas focus on dopamine-containing nerve cells in a brain area at the very base of the brain called the ventral tegmental area, or VTA. And the projections of these dopamine-containing nerve cells to the forebrain, to frontal parts of the brain, like prefrontal cortex, nucleus accumbens, amygdala, hippocampus, and others. Drugs of abuse act on this circuitry with a power and persistence that's not seen in the natural world, stronger than food, sex, and social interaction, and over time produce changes in these brain areas so that in the extreme, an addict doesn't feel the normal reward signal of these natural rewards and requires a drug of abuse in order to feel normally rewarded. And we can actually look at this circuit and I could describe for you precisely how each drug of abuse, despite its unique chemical structure, its different protein target, exerts the same functional effect. So if you focus now on a VTA dopamine neuron, innervating a nucleus accumbens neuron that makes another neurotransmitter called GABA. That's shown in this slide. Here's the VTA dopamine neuron innervating a GABA neuron in nucleus accumbens. And here are some other nerve cells in that circuit. I'm not going to describe this slide in detail, but the red, the boxes in red illustrate the very different sites of action of all known drugs of abuse, but the net functional effect of each of those actions is the same. Every drug of abuse has the net effect of increasing dopamine transmission to these nucleus accumbens neurons uh, in, uh, that make uh, GABA and also produce dopamine-like effects on these GABA nucleus accumbens neurons through different types of mechanisms. So this is the answer to our question of how drugs of different structures converge into a, a shared a circuit mechanism that drives addiction. Now, everything that I've described so far refers to the response of a single uh, exposure to a drug of abuse. Yet we know that addiction is not a response to one drug event, but uh, develops progressively and re to repeated drug exposure. Uh, and for that reason, we view addiction as a form of drug-induced neuroplasticity. So according to that view, repeated exposure to a drug, repeated actions at the synapse will trigger changes inside of this postsynaptic 
a nerve cell involving what we call intracellular chemical messengers, driving long-lasting, sometimes lifelong changes in the chemistry of these nerve cells. That's shown in greater detail in the next slide, where I'm now providing information on the identity of some of these intracellular chemical changes involving what we call second messengers and protein phosphorylation and regulation of a class of proteins in the cell nucleus called transcription factors, proteins that bind to DNA and regulate the ability of DNA to transcribe their target genes. And these drug-induced changes in transcription factors and target genes are responsible then for these very stable changes in neural function that drive the behavioral abnormalities associated with an addiction. So let me tell you more about what I mean when I talk, when I use the term transcription factor and gene expression. Before doing so, let me make the other point that all current medications used to treat addiction focus on the extracellular aspect of the synapse, leaving unexplored many thousands of potential drug targets for future drug discovery, which I'll come to at the very end of my talk. So we know that genes are encoded in DNA. The DNA double helix is depicted here in a cartoon fashion. The mammalian organism consists of about three billion base pairs depicted here in linear sequence. We also know that three billion nucleotides when stretched out linearly would be about two meters in length. Yet, this two meters of DNA is compacted in every cell on the body within the microscopic cell nucleus. And we've learned a great deal over the last two decades in how that compaction occurs through a process called epigenetics. So we know that the DNA double helix is wrapped around octamers of histone proteins to form the unit of chromatin called a nucleosome. Chromatin is the word used to describe the chemical contents of a nucleus. These nucleosomes are then further organized and compacted in the most compacted extent in what we would recognize as a chromosome. And this degree of opening or compaction of DNA and nucleosomes is crucially important because DNA contained in these compacted areas of chromatin are too compacted to be functional, they're inactive, whereas DNA in these more open areas of chromatin can be active. And that makes it possible for us to use epigenetics to understand the genes that are regulated by drugs, how they're regulated by drugs, and by analogy with cancer, biology and developmental biology, where some of these types of changes in compaction of chromatin, once they occur, are lifelong. Our hypothesis has been perhaps chronic exposure to drugs of abuse produce similar permanent changes in chromatin structure that would then drive lifelong changes in the functioning of the nerve cells in which these changes are occurring and then in behavior. And the point that I made earlier that addiction is roughly half genetic and half non-genetic further emphasizes the likely importance of these epigenetic mechanisms that I've just described. So let me just go back a little bit and say a little bit more about, at a basic level, about what I am telling you. We know a mammalian organism has about 20,000 genes. That's about 20,000 segments along these 3 billion nucleotides of DNA. Each of these 20,000 genes encoding typically more than one messenger RNA, a different type of chemical substance, encoded by the DNA. Each messenger RNA then encoding typically more than one type of protein. And it is the proteins in the brain that are responsible for all of the brain's chemical messengers. Many proteins themselves are chemical messengers or they control the levels of other chemical substances that serve messenger functions in the brain. And these chemical messengers are responsible for all normal and abnormal aspects of brain function. Transcription factors, which I described a few minutes ago, are types of proteins that control this process. They're master control proteins that, it, that determine the types and amounts of proteins that every cell in the body makes. 
So let me describe an example of a transcription factor that my lab implicated in drug addiction starting many years ago. The name of the protein is called Delta Fos B. It doesn't matter what that name means. It's a type of transcription factor. It belongs to a family of related transcription factors referred to as the Fos family. And this uh, slide comes from an experiment that Bruce Hope did in the lab over 25 years ago now, showing that when a rat is given an acute dose of cocaine, there is the induction of all known Fos family proteins. The darker the bands, the more protein exists. And you can see that in response to a single dose of cocaine, Delta Fos B is induced only to a small extent. Very differently, after chronic cocaine exposure, this occurs in the nucleus accumbens, there is the, a relative smaller induction of these other Fos proteins, but a dramatic accumulation of modified forms of Delta Fos B. We described this at the time as a type of molecular switch that occurs whereby this chemical messenger master control protein in the brain is changing as a consequence of chronic to uh, from acute to chronic drug exposure. A lot of work in the years since have shown that Delta Fos B mediates sensitized drug responses and it serves this function for every class of abused drug. I'm just going to show you one example of this type of data that was published a number of years ago as shown at the bottom. This is using a condition place preference procedure where if you look at control animals, those animals described in these gray bars, remember I said that condition place preference uh, describes where an animal will learn to spend more time in a drug paired environment and as animals are trained with higher doses of cocaine, you can see they spend more time uh, in the cocaine pair chamber. When we use genetic models to induce Delta Fos B, specifically in the same cells of the brain regions where drugs induce the protein, nothing else it has been done to these animals. They've never uh, seen a drug of abuse. These animals are now far more sensitive to cocaine exposure. The opposite happens when we use genetic tools to overexpress and an artificial protein called Delta Jundi. Again, it doesn't matter what that means. When we turn, when we turn on Delta Jundi in the same brain areas, we can make animals less sensitive to the rewarding effects of cocaine. These effects seen by place conditioning have also been observed by drug self-administration assays. And we've been able to do a series of studies to identify the range of target genes through which Delta Fos B produces this sensitizing effect on drug reward. And many of these proteins are located at the synapse, uh, which is not surprising. And I'll come back to that again toward the end of the talk. Now, these studies on Delta Fos B and other studies like them involved us guessing at what proteins would be most important in the addiction process. For example, in this earlier study, we had to guess that Fos family proteins might be interesting. More recently, the advent of what we call next generation sequencing methods has made it possible for us to take a much more unbiased, open-ended view of that question. And so for the next uh, several slides, I'll describe more recent research where we've embarked on that approach. This is the result of a very large experiment done by Dina Walker, Aaron Kalapari, and others in the lab where we had mice self-administer cocaine or saline for a period of uh, oh, uh, 10 days. We then harvested some of the animals 24 hours after that self-administration procedure. Other animals were withdrawn from cocaine for 30 days. And then at that 30-day time point, we're given a challenge dose of either cocaine or saline. So total of six groups. We then analyzed six brain areas, all of which I've described to you previously, as being important in the addiction process. This 30-day withdrawal period turns out to be really interesting because we know that in animals and in some humans as well, there is a process called incubation that occurs as a result that when we take an animal 24 hours after self-administration, put them back in the box, enable them to press the drug-paired lever again, although now the, the 
lever is turned off, they're not getting any cocaine. Animals will show a response that they're trying to get the cocaine. But at the 30-day withdrawal time point, you can see that that behavior has been increased substantially. An example of incubation during prolonged withdrawal from drug exposure. And then we used a method called RNA sequencing that allows us to identify all of the genes that are expressed in a given brain area at these different time points. I'm just showing you data for the nucleus accumbens, but we have data for the other brain areas as well. And we used advanced bioinformatics to help us focus on the genes that were uniquely regulated at this 30-day time point, genes that were uniquely regulated before the cocaine challenge and genes that are uniquely regulated after that cocaine challenge. So here are examples of genes that show different, significantly different expression at these two 30-day time points. Here are genes that show different regulation at that 30-day time point, but only in response to that priming dose of cocaine. And you can see dramatic reorganing, reorganization of gene expression profiles at these 30-day time points under both conditions. For those of you who are not familiar in looking at these, uh, what we call heat maps, each of these vertical lines in a heat map represents expression levels of an individual gene. The yellow genes are those that are upregulated, and the blue genes are those that are downregulated. And you can see, again, vast reorganization of genes that are induced and suppressed at these 30-day time points. Now, I mentioned at the outset that different animals exhibit different levels of inherent addictability, just the way humans exhibit different addictability. So we wanted to correlate these changes in gene expression with this uh, risk for addiction seen behaviorally. This heat map shown at the left then is not a gene heat map, rather it's a behavior heat map. Each yellow line or blue line indicates a type of behavior that's either increased or decreased in each individual animal and looking at many uh, forms of behavioral output. Using machine learning, we composed what we called an addiction index, just a rough measure, rough inference of how addicted each individual mouse was at the end of that self-administration period. You can see the animals that self-administered saline appropriately showed very low levels of addictiveness as to be expected. But notice that among the animals that were uh, given the opportunity to self-administer cocaine, there was a wide range. Some animals were not so addicted. Other animals consumed quite large amounts of cocaine and showed stronger levels of addicted behavior. The next process then was to relate these two enormous data sets, relating uh, the long-lasting changes in gene expression at that 30-day withdrawal time point, but also looking at which of those genes whose expression was correlated with the addiction index. That's what I'm showing in these heat maps now. Those genes under this gray bar were negatively associated with the addiction index. These genes under red, positively associated again with blue being genes that are downregulated, yellow being genes that are upregulated. And I'm showing you two brain areas, nucleus accumbens, and another brain region, ventral area of hippocampus, which is also very important in the addiction process. But notice the different patterns in these two brain regions. One of the striking findings apparent in nucleus accumbens was that many of the same genes that showed clear responses after their first ever exposure to cocaine were related to the same genes that were affected and highly correlated with the addiction index only changed in the opposite direction. This finding suggests a very interesting conclusion that one might be able to tell the relative addictiveness of an individual by the initial changes in gene expression that occur within this one brain region nucleus accumbens if we could access that information in a person, even though the specific changes that occur later on after drug self-administration, after prolonged withdrawal and relapse, might be very different in direction. 
And notice that this opposite pattern of regulation, blue acute, yellow chronic, yellow acute, blue chronic, is not seen so much in the ventral hippocampus or other brain region studies. Now, based on this work, we can also ask the computer to tell us, among all of these genes that show interesting relationships to addiction-related behavior, what are the predicted upstream transcription factors that are involved? And what was very reassuring was that delta Fos b and its family of transcription factors was heavily linked, suggesting that our guess 25 years ago was a good guess, but it highlighted at the same time many additional types of transcription factors which had never been studied before in addiction syndrome. So this is now pointing the field in very different directions to understand transcription factors in addition to delta Fos B, which are also very important in the addiction process. This slide illustrates that the magnitude of our gene expression data sets, which are many terabytes in size, can be used for much more complex forms of bioinformatic analysis. I'm not going to go over this slide in detail due to time limitations, but I want to highlight this heat map uh, to the left. Uh, I'm sorry, the heat map to the right. This heat map is showing the effects of chronic cocaine exposure on male versus female mice, mice that are uh, normal mice, but also mice that have been exposed to chronic stress earlier in life. When you look at normal female and male mice, you can see the very different effects that chronic cocaine exposure has on gene expression profiles in the two species, and that these sex differences are dramatically influenced by an earlier exposure to stress in life. I'm not going to describe this in greater detail, simply to say that looking at sex differences in addiction is extremely important. And looking at addiction, not in isolation, but in the t context of an individual's entire series of lifetime exposures, like stress, becomes a high priority for the field. These large RNA-seq data sets also allow us to answer a crucial question in the addiction field, namely, what, to what extent do the mechanisms by which each type of drug of abuse produces addiction are shared or not shared by other drugs of abuse? What I'm showing you in this slide are published uh, uh, data sets from mouse comparing gene expression changes produced by chronic cocaine or a chronic opioid like morphine in two brain reward regions of mice, the VTA and the nucleus accumbens, showing dramatic overlap in the gene expression changes produced by these two drugs of abuse, highlighting the importance of shared mechanisms of addiction. Interestingly, a very different result can be compiled from studies of the human prefrontal cortex, a published study of ours from a couple of years ago, and uh, which studied cocaine in a work in progress by Deborah Mash and Shrum Akbarian and colleagues looking at opioid addiction in humans where there's not that shared signal of drug regulation. And in fact, there's even evidence of some opposite changes in drug, um, in gene expression. This slide highlights, summarizes what we feel reflects the field, that there are many common core symptoms of addiction, but also many drug-specific mechanisms of addiction, and that in order to eventually conquer human addiction, we'll need to address both shared and drug-specific mechanisms. The last point that I want to make today is that each part of the brain that's involved in addiction is not homogeneous. It's comprised of many different cell types. So the nucleus accumbens, which I've been focusing on, for example, is comprised primarily of two different types of neurons called medium spiny neurons defined by the type of dopamine receptor they predominantly express, D1 receptors or D2 receptors. These neurons tend to show different anatomical projections. D2 neurons go to the pallidum. The D1 nerve cells tend to go back to the VTA. 
A lot of work in the field by my lab and many other labs have shown also that these two types of neurons, each representing about half of all neurons in the nucleus accumbens, subserve very different functions in drug mechanisms. So for example, using tools like optogenetics, it's been possible to show that activation of these D1 nerve cells of nucleus accumbens promotes drug reward, while activation of D2 nerve cells has the opposite effect. Conversely, using tools like fiber photometry and other methods, it's been possible to show in awake behaving animals that exposure to cocaine tends to produce opposite effects on the activity of these nerve cells that might be expected based on their opposite effects on drug reward per se. In general drug exposure, it's much more complicated than what's summarized here, but in general, drug exposure tends to activate the activity of D1 medium spiny neurons, but depresses the activity of D2 medium spiny neurons. And going back to delta Fos B, one of the really interesting observations that we made a number of years ago, worked by Mary Kay Lobo and colleagues, is that delta Fos B is induced specifically in the D1 type of medium spiny neurons by all drugs of abuse, very specifically, only in the D1 type of nerve cell, except for opioid drugs of abuse, which induce delta Fos B in both nerve cells, highlighting a very interesting specific way in which opioids are different from the other drugs of abuse and something that we're very interested in understanding mechanisms in driving this difference and also the consequences for the subsequent addiction syndromes. Knowing about the dramatic differences in these two uh, subtypes of nucleus accumbens neurons has also then driven the use of more advanced tools in next generation sequencing that allow us to basically repeat the studies I just described to you that looked at the entire nucleus accumbens, but looking here selectively at individual cell types. So I'm gonna describe a method called ATAC sequencing. In the cartoon at the upper right of the slide, I'm just making the point that ATAC sequencing provides a method to determine how open or closed different segments of DNA are across the entire genome. The slides are showing the results of ATAC sequencing. This is work done by Philip Muse in the lab. In D1 medium spiny neurons of nucleus accumbens or D2 neurons of medium spiny neurons. The higher the peaks shows the more open the chromatin is. The graphs are focused around what's called the transcription start site. That's where a gene begins to encode a certain messenger RNA and nucleotides, a thousand nucleotides upstream or downstream of those transcription start sites. This is looking genome-wide, averaging across, say, roughly 20,000 genes. In comparing D1 cells and D2 cells, one can see that D2 cells actually have, on average, more open chromatin, the pink lines, than, D2, than the chromatin in D1 cells. More genes are expressed at baseline in D2 medium spiny neurons. But notice the dramatic differences in responses to acute and chronic cocaine. A single dose of acute cocaine has a small effect across all genes and D2 cells, but a dramatic effect in the D1 nerve cells. That effect is maintained through 30 days of withdrawal, this burnt orange line, and an effect that grows in size with chromatin opening still further after a priming dose of cocaine in these withdrawn animals showing dramatic reorganization reorgani of the chromatin within D1 medium spiny neurons that far exceeds that than what's seen in D2 medium spiny neurons. So the question becomes then, what is mediating at the very detailed molecular level these long-lasting, month-long in this case, changes in the opening and closing of chromatin selectively in D1 nerve cells. Again, we and other groups have guessed at possible mechanisms involved. Much of that work is published. I'm not gonna describe it here. What I wanted to mention here, rather, are our efforts to identify uh, the, 
mechanisms in a completely open-ended, unbiased manner. Again, this is work done by Philip Muse in the lab in collaboration with Ben Garcia's lab at Penn and Simona Sidoli in particular within that lab, where we could use a method called proteomics, simply a word that describes the ability to analyze thousands of proteins at the same time, asking how is chromatin modified biochemically after exposure to cocaine? What I'm showing you here so far is changes seen in response to an acute cocaine exposure. We are now uh, looking at changes after chronic cocaine exposure. That's work underway. This is a complex slide. Let me explain uh, what it is showing. I mentioned that a nucleosome represents DNA wrapped around an octamer of histone proteins. That octamer of histone proteins is an octamer because it contains eight subunits, two copies of each of four types of histones, H3, H4, H2A, and H2B. And each of these uh, categories, these codes here, are describing a different type of biochemical modification of that particular histone protein. You can see how complicated epigenetic mechanisms are. Just to give you an example of what this means, H H3K4ME1 means adding one methyl group to lysine 4 of histone H3 and so on. AC stands for acetylation, another, me another important mode of histone regulation. The color code are showing you those um, histone modifications that are downregulated in blue or upregulated in yellow in response to acute cocaine exposure. You can see that many of the changes that are that show up as most being most dramatic, in particular changes in this variant histone subunit called H2AZ, are changes that we would have never guessed as being important in cocaine action, or at least it would have taken us a long time to get to these changes. By using this type of open-ended method, we can now focus very rapidly on H2AZ and these other histone marks mentioned in red uh, to use a method called chip sequencing, which will enable us to look at the changes that are occurring in these particular histone modifications as candidate mechanisms for what we refer to as chromatin scars chromatin scars being these types of changes in histones and other nuclear proteins induced by cocaine that last very long times within the nucleus, driving changes in the opening and closing of chromatin as described by ATAC sequencing, which in turn drive changes in the expression of these genes as depicted by RNA sequencing. So let me then conclude with this summary scheme. What I've made the point to you over the course of the lecture is that drugs of abuse initially target synapses in the brain, where one nerve cell comes in close approximation to another nerve cell. This blowout is describing greater details of, that, of the functioning of a synapse where neurotransmitter is released. Those are the purple circles acting on receptors, these blue figures driving these downstream changes. These synaptic events will regulate the initial behavioral effects of a drug, giving us, making us high, producing side effects, whatever. But at the same time, the, these signals will also travel to the cell nucleus. And over time, as drug exposure can, continues, and as these signals accumulate and grow, the effects on the cell nucleus will build as well to the point where there will be dramatic reorganization of chromatin. So I'm showing you here the DNA double helix is this what looks like a ribbon wrapped around octamers of histones, uh, which looks like these beads packed together, transcription factors controlling this process, and many other proteins, hundreds of proteins involved in opening and closing of chromatin. We believe that the kinds of open-ended maps that I've been describing uh, today provide an unprecedented template of the range of synaptic proteins that are regulated 
over long time spans by repeated exposure to drugs of abuse and provides now a template for drug discovery efforts. It also raises the interesting possibility that there might even be an opportunity to target some of these epigenetic mechanisms themselves. This would be a novel approach to the treatment of drug addiction, but it's supported by the idea that many novel treatments for cancer and immunologic diseases are, are now being uh, based on epigenetic mechanisms. So a lot of these molecules targeting epigenetic mechanisms are available for clinical trials and could be studied relatively quickly in drug abuse models guided by the kinds of basic animal findings that I've described to you today. So let me just conclude by making a few summary points. As I mentioned at the outset, we know that addiction is mediated by very powerful psychological and social factors, but that it also at its core describes a very biological process and that great strides have been made in understanding that underlying biology. That means understanding when a drug gets into the brain, the protein it first binds to, where that protein is located in the reward circuitry, how that binding affects the functioning of the reward circuitry, and how that changes over a period of repeated drug exposure to change that, those reward neurons so that they're essentially permanently altered and drive behavioral syndromes of addiction. The current challenge is to translate these really vast and impressive discoveries into improved clinical care. Progress has been extremely frustrating uh, in terms of this translation, but we feel that the combination of the advanced tools uh, that are available today in neuroscience will make this, this translation much more feasible over the next five to 10 years than over the past 30 years. I focus today on the tools of molecular biology, these open-ended methods that allow us to focus on transcriptional and epigenetic mechanisms when combined with other tools that I only briefly mentioned of allowing us to study the circuits in the brain also at an unprecedented level. Combining those two approaches, we hope and believe, will enable us to make these translational advances at long last. And I do want to give a, uh, uh, to, summer, to just emphasize the importance of open-ended, unbiased characterization in, in uh, scientific discovery. We don't yet know enough about what causes addiction to simply stop and just do the translation. We need to continue unbiased, fundamental, basic research of drug addiction to come up with a much more complete categorization of these long-lasting changes, like I described today at the transcriptional and epigenetic level, among many specific types of nerve cells in many brain regions, I just focused on two cell types in one brain region, which will give us insight into what I've called these chromin and scars that we believe can institute and maintain addiction for a lifetime. And I do want to thank the funding of my lab over many years by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. We would not have been able to make these studies uh, without this robust support. So at this point, Jeff, I'd be very happy to open the floor to the audience and asking and ask, answer questions that people may have. Um, wonderful. Uh, first of all, Eric, thank you. You really were able to present some very complicated science um, in, in a way that is uh, lay friendly. And I, I think that um, one of the key take home points for people listening is that your work and the work of others clearly demonstrate um, that uh, chemical dependency, addiction, is, is not moral weakness, but an illness like many other illnesses, and there is a biological basis for that illness. Uh, Absolutely. I'd like you to just comment on, 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 on that in, in terms of um, you know, how important that is. Absolutely. You know, we, we uh, have the additional burden in psychiatry that the organ affected by our illnesses, the brain, also happens to be the organ that determines how we think, remember, and what really determines who and what we are as people. And it means that drugs of abuse will gradually and progressively 
attack parts of the brain and produce brain damage. And that people with an addiction problem uh, should be viewed as individuals with clear damage to key parts of the brain that uh, determine their decision making. So when people who are have an addiction are criticized by many in our culture as being weak people or people with failed uh, mores, uh, it is the wrong way to view this because what has happened to these individuals is that the very parts of their brain that control decision making and good choices are the ones that are damaged by exposure to drugs of abuse. So we need to look at addiction as a biological process and a syndrome, just like any other syndrome, whether it's heart disease, diabetes, or a cancer, that require biological treatments and just the way addiction and psychiatric syndromes will require biological treatments and social psychological rehabilitation, all those other syndromes that I mentioned also require non-biological treatments too. Person after a heart attack goes for cardiac rehab, nutritional advice, and so on. A very good comparison, very good um, explanation. I want to ask you about the, the work that you're doing in terms of what you are referring to as drug-induced neuroplasticity, which is changes in the brain as a result of the, the drug usage. Is Have you found differences based upon the age of the individual, whether it be a laboratory uh, animal or, or human beings, the age of the individual and this uh, neuroplasticity or changes in the brain? Yes. Uh, this is, uh, my, my lab has done some work on that. Most of the work has been done by other labs around the country and world. But we know that the sensitivity of an individual to a drug of abuse varies as a function of the age of the individual. And in general, uh, work by many labs has shown that the adolescent brain, both in rodents and in humans, is much more sensitive to these addiction-mediating uh, forms of plasticity in the brain. Uh, and therefore, we think that uh, one of the greatest public health challenges we have is to get as many teenagers as possible not to take drugs, uh, because drugs seem to be much less dangerous to individuals once they get older. So really for the general public, for parents, teachers, and for young people, the risks, the risks of using drugs in teenage years, early 20s, is greater than the risk of using drugs, not that there is no risk, but greater than the risk at an older age. That is correct. And there's also a separate literature that has examined the effects of drug exposure uh, on the fetus in a woman's uterus and that when a mother uh, uses drugs during pregnancy or if a young child is exposed to drugs in the environment, for example, tobacco smoke of uh, adult smoking in his or her vicinity, the, uh, the, the young brain, the, the prenatal brain and the, and the brain right after birth also are highly vulnerable. So we need to, in terms of public health, uh, look at ways of reducing drug exposure from the earliest stages of development through early 20s. The, um, you spoke a lot about cocaine, you spoke about opiates and, and other drugs. The um, current movement to legalize marijuana in states around the country, what's your take on that in terms of this risk issue? Yeah, so I, I think that our, that we have a lot of neurobiology and public policy knowledge that will teach us uh, a lot about how to uh, view this problem. I mean, I, my personal viewpoint as a li person uh, that's libertarian is that I think a, an adult individual should have the right to take a drug if he or she chooses, um, mm -hmm. but that is going to occur at consequences for the rest of us to face. So we know that when drugs are legalized, they will be used by more people and taken at higher doses. Uh, this was shown very clearly during prohibition in the United States, 
where despite the disaster that prohibition represented in many ways, we know that the use of alcohol and the use of alcohol-related problems, including alcoholism, cirrhosis of the liver, and so on, were dramatically reduced during period of prohibition. Yet, prohibition also illustrates the, dram the dramatic cost of that type of criminal justice approach. And in fact, prohibition was eventually reversed because the criminal justice implications were just too vast to deal with. I would argue that here we are in 2019, decades after wars declared on different drugs of abuse over the last several decades, those, our wars on drugs of abuse have failed. Cocaine is less expensive today than it was 30 years ago. Same for heroin, despite billions, trillions of dollars being spent by our federal government and state governments in inter interdicting uh, drug uh, supply. So I think that we need to face facts. Certain drugs like marijuana, alcohol, tobacco are going to be legal. We just have to face that. Uh, yet we also should face the facts that when they're, then they have legal status, more people are going to run into problems with those drugs. Uh, we're beginning to see that in states that now have legalized marijuana. There will be increased traffic accidents and other personal injuries involved um, in, in the states uh, that uh, change the legal status of marijuana. Therefore, it is an obligation of these states that have legalized marijuana to use some of the tax income that they get from the sales of the drug to provide help for those people. And, and that is not happening right now uh, to an effective degree. States rather are taking the tax money and using it for other purposes. So we need to take a holistic view. We need to look at what it is about our culture that has uh, driven very high rates of drug use and drug addiction among our young people, high levels of stress, crime, poverty, trauma, and so on. We need to uh, work very hard to reduce drug use in young people, as we've already talked about, and try to protect people and try to get people to make wise, intelligent, and good choices for themselves um, in this new era where marijuana, in addition to tobacco products and alcohol, are legalized. The, um, I, I think the very well said and very important. I want to ask you about, um, we know that there are people who have uh, chemical dependency and with the current treatments are able to um, be in recovery and stop using. But there are people who may receive treatments and relapse and relapse yet again. Is there anything in the basic science that you've been doing that may help explain why one person is able to be in recovery and another person relapses? Yes, I mean, we can see this in animals as well, and the ability to demonstrate it in animals is important because that makes it possible to then go into the brain and identify factors that might be different. So if you recall on one of the slides I showed is a big range of addictive-like behavior shown by animals. Another difference that's seen that I didn't talk about today is that if you take animals that show a similar level of addictiveness after a period of drug self-administration, there are big individual differences in the course of what happens during withdrawal. Some animals will withdraw, stop using drug, and even when given relapse triggers, they will not relapse, whether other animals are very sensitive to those triggers and will relapse quickly and readily. Uh, we can now use the kind of tools that I talked about today to understand the changes in the brain that drive that different response, that different risk for relapse. The real challenge for the field is to then take that knowledge and apply it to people. So I mentioned that on this last slide that I show here, is how can we develop tools, brain imaging tools, genetic tools, whatever, that will enable us to uh, tell a person, listen, you have particular changes in your body that are indicative of a severe addiction syndrome. You are going to be at increased risk for relapse for a long time, which we can track with you. 
by repeated measures of these tests and uh, to target resources to those individuals and to devise better ways of treating them. I think this is one of the most important avenues of uh, current uh, treatment uh, discovery that we have today. Well, Eric, I want to, I could continue on for, for another hour, but our time is, is just about up. I want to thank you for your presentation and more importantly, for the ongoing work that you and members of your lab have been doing to help us better understand and ultimately develop new and better treatments to, uh, for people who have chemical dependency um, and potentially methods of prevention as well. So thank you very, very much for, for all that you do. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Yeah, thank you. I, I also want to thank everybody who joined us today. All of the research we fund is made possible through private donations. So please consider making a contribution by visiting our website, bbrfoundation.org, or call us at 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion of the presentation or would like to share it with family and friends, please visit the events and webinars page on our website. Finally, I hope you will join us again next month when Dr. Colleen McClung, Professor of Psychiatry and Clinical Translational Science at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine will present Circadian Rhythms and Bipolar Disorder. This webinar will take place on Tuesday, April 9th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Once again, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of the day. Take care.